I pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Now, good morning. So here's the question. Do you remember your baptism? How many of you were old enough to remember? Ah, more at this service than the earlier. How many of you were too young to remember? Ah, most likely in our tradition. Do you know your baptism date? Have you seen the photos? True confession, my photos were in black and white. (laughs) These are the questions that we ask the parents and godparents as we prepare for baptism. And I think they're important questions. It is the job of the parents and the godparents to answer the questions on behalf of the child being baptized to say those words of the baptismal covenant. We help parents and godparents to prepare. We teach, we encourage. We encourage the parents and godparents to help the child to know about their baptism, to show the photos, to tell the story, to celebrate the anniversaries. And importantly, we encourage the parents and godparents to help the child to know about their baptism, to remember just how much God loves them, to embrace faith in God, to live as children of God, to be part of the body of Christ, the church, in our time. To say that the parents and godparents have an important job is truly an understatement. Now, for an adult being baptized, the answers to the baptism questions are life-changing. What do I turn from? What do I die to so that I can live a life in Christ? When an adult is baptized, it's where John's baptism of repentance combines with the baptism of water and the Holy Spirit. Now, as a congregation, we answer the question loudly, will you do all in your power to support this person and this child? in their life in Christ. I know you do. We sign the baptismal certificates. The Brotherhood of St. Andrew crafts a wonderful faith chest for the family to take and keep those important signs and symbols and memories in a safe place. I wonder if you know that Barbara Clifford, in our office, keeps up with the materials we mail out monthly to the families. It's a pamphlet called Splash and it goes out with faith ideas for your child at that age. As a people, we are gathered here today as a church. We will renew our own baptismal vows. And I think it's important with all of these things that we do, it's important to hear the story again of Jesus' baptism. Our lectionary apparently agrees as we hear the words of John the Baptist in today's gospel for the fourth time in six weeks. Through Advent and Christmas, we have repeatedly heard the testimony of John the Baptist. Second Advent, third Advent, Christmas morning, today. John the Evangelist, teaching us, encouraging us. Through Advent and Christmas, we have heard the messages, prepare, repent, watch. We know that one is coming who is greater. We know that it's not John. We know that John is humbled at the thought of a Messiah and that we might be too. Today we hear the story of Jesus' baptism according to Mark. We are in year B of our lectionary and we will focus on Mark's gospel. And this story is where Mark's gospel begins. We've had the benefit of hearing the birth of Jesus from Matthew and Luke in these past weeks. But Mark begins with today's baptism encounters. Mark has a direct and immediate style. In his book, The Moral Vision of the New Testament, theologian Richard Hayes says this, the world according to Mark is a world torn open by God. From the moment when the heavens are torn apart at Jesus' baptism to the moment when the curtain is torn in two at his death, this is a story of God's powerful incursion 
into the created order. And if we'd been standing in that world of Mark and John, like the people gathered at the riverbank, we would have been hearing this repeated testimony of John, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And then, one day, we'd look up, and in that day, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. The one who is more powerful than John has arrived. The baptism is both water and spirit. With Jesus' baptism, bam, the message changes. The game changes. Imagine that you were standing by that riverside with all of the anticipation and watching. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and a spirit descending like a dove on him. Jesus, looking up, seeing the heavens open and that dove descending. John, looking up, seeing the heavens open and the spirit of God descending like a dove. You and me, looking up, seeing the heavens open and the Spirit of God descending. And then the voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. First, those words for Jesus to hear. Then, for all to hear and see. God's love bursts onto that scene. God's love showers all who are standing by the riverside. God's love showers all standing through history, hearing this lesson again and again. A Lutheran pastor that I know has said that with each baptism he witnesses, he watches. He watches for the moment as the person lifts their head and the water drips down their face. He listens for God's voice saying, this is my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. You have all witnessed moments like that right here at St. Paul's and in churches across the country, at baptisms of family and friends and strangers. It is a sacramental moment. You remember that a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace that already exists. The sacrament of baptism points to that indissoluble love of God for each one of us. The sacrament of baptism points to that grace of God in each one of us. The sacrament of baptism shows us the belovedness of each of us. We point to that belovedness as we baptize with water. We watch for the spirit to descend. We anoint with oil to seal the deal. We light the candle and say, let your light so shine before others that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You've been there in that sacramental moment. Now imagine God looking at you that way, as beloved. Imagine God looking at each one of us as beloved. If we saw each other as God sees us, it would solve a lot. If we could see each other as beloved, it would change the dynamic of this world. It's easy to see the belovedness of some people. Others, not so easy. But in our baptismal covenant, we vow to respect the dignity of every human being. We strive to see the belovedness of each other, to see the divine in each other. And if we'd see that belovedness, well, I think we'd act differently. People would not hold grudges. People might work together and not against each other. People would not hit each other or hurt each other. We'd celebrate different gifts and talents not denigrate, 
we would not humiliate, disrespect, or ridicule others. There would be no racism. Nigeria would be a peaceful, prosperous country. France would be a peaceful place today. Our own streets would be safe and free. We would beat our swords into plowshares and feed the hungry children of this world. We would look at each other and see God's face, see God's beloved. So I think our opening question takes on new meaning. Do you remember your baptism? Lots of amazing things start with our baptism. Gifts, power. So let's be the baptized. Let's go out from here this week, moving onward into 2015, and make a difference in this world. Look at each other with belovedness. Remember your baptism today and every day. Amen. <laughs>